Well, we're going to talk about how traumatic brain injuries can lead to an addiction. And sometimes it's not easy to put two and two together, but if you have played any kind of headbanging sport for any period of time and you start developing depression, confusion, isolation, hopelessness, um, all of these things can lead to an addiction. And so it's, um, I always like to say that these are things that, that athletes definitely need to consider if they're ever having any of these symptoms and drinking a lot, taking pills, anything to look for relief. The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return, sponsored by Narconon Ojai. Hello, and welcome to The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. My name is Joni Siegel, and I'm the hostess for this podcast. When a person is addicted to drugs and or alcohol, the myriad of choices of treatments can be overwhelming. Narconon Ojai is a proven residential treatment facility that addresses the physical, mental, and spiritual aspects of addiction with an evidence-based step-by-step program designed to free those trapped by addiction. For more information, call 1-866-231-5924. Today's episode is episode number 180, and today we have a lady on the podcast who recorded with us several months ago perhaps it was last year, and she is the wife of a former NFL football player who passed away due to alcoholism that was related to physical injuries that he received while playing football. After playing college football at Abilene Christian University, Grant Fiesel was a starting center and long snapper for the Seattle Seahawks from 1987 to 1992 after starting his pro football career with the old Baltimore Colts in 1983. As his wife Cindy, who we're talking to today, shares on the pages of her book, After the Cheering Stops, those jarring collisions with powerful nose guards took their toll on Grant in physical, mental, and spiritual ways. That's because Grant drunk, drank to dull the pain that began in his brain, a brain muddled by a history of repetitive trauma and symptomatic concussions. He drank and drank until the alcohol killed him. Grant's death certificate lists ESLD, end-stage liver disease, a form of cirrhosis of the liver, as the cause of his demise. But his family later learned that he also suffered from a degenerative brain disease known as chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, which has been the focus of lawsuits from former NFL players and the topic of a Hollywood movie, Concussion, starring Will Smith. In After the Cheering Stops, Cindy Fiesel describes how Grant's attempts at self-medicating his pain devastated their family, but also left her with a mission to raise awareness about CTE and head trauma injuries in sports, as well as educate athletes and parents about the potential damage of head injuries. She believes that Grant would be cheering her on to share his story as a cautionary tale of what can happen when you play a sport you love, but has inherent risks that wreak physical damage and can result in drug or alcohol addiction. Let's talk to Cindy Fiesel. So then, Cindy, thank you so much for being on the podcast today, talking to us again. I think that the story that you have to tell is super important for people to hear. And um, yeah, thank you for sharing again. Thank you so much for the opportunity because I always feel like it's a, um, you know, a blessing whenever I get to say Grant's story because the more people that hear it, the better it is. Well, and I think you said when we talked before that, um, you know, Grant, or, or maybe I read it in your bio that Grant would really like what you're doing now. And so I feel like when we do this, you know, it just, it, once again, we're, Basically, we're validating 
the goodness and the rightness that was Grant Fiesel. Sure. And he was a good person. Yes, absolutely. And that's where some people get confused because they think that maybe I'm trying to spread bad news, but I'm really trying to spread hope. I agree. I totally agree. So start at the beginning. How did Grant's problem with drugs and alcohol, how did it start for him? Well, for him, it started when I recognized it, um, it started in the NFL and he had already played about eight seasons and he ended up playing 10 seasons, 117 games over 10 years. So around season eight, he'd had some serious injuries, lots of surgeries. Um, Just looking for relief, I think, Uh, not knowing exactly what to do. And I think that he wanted to play more all of a sudden he realized he was in his thirties and um, he didn't know whether to quit or whether to keep going, but you know, there was bills to pay. You get into this lifestyle that we'd gotten into with uh, mortgages, car payments, you know, such as that. And uh, he wanted to ride the waves all the way to the end. And so in order to do that, um, you just have to take something. You have to be shot up with something, or you have to drink something, or there, there's just no body. People believe, people forget that it's a human body that's doing this uh, playing football. It's very taxing. People look at it as a video game, and it's real people. <laughs> and their bodies take all of this punishment and abuse, and maybe they could stop after a year or two and recover, but when you get into going, you know, eight, nine, ten plus years, the human body really can't handle it. So it was around eight years. In the okay, NFL. but but he played football in high school and in college. Yes? Oh, yes, he played football since he was eight years old. So he played from age eight to thirty-two. That was not realistic. <laughs> <laughs> it's not realistic. And again, you get caught up in a lifestyle. And I think that Grant and I got caught up in a lifestyle, thinking that we were living for today, and not thinking about the future. And caught up, I think, I'm just going to, I'm not a professional athlete, but I'm going to say caught up in the um, adrenaline rush Mm -hmm. that is playing a professional sport. I I remember, yep, I remember a story when I was in high school and basketball, and one of the members of our basketball team had, had, I don't know, it was some kind of a, some kind of an impact with somebody on the court, and actually knocked a tooth out and he played the rest of the game before he actually realized that he he was in pain he had a problem there and i think there's such an adrenaline rush to playing a sport like that and winning a sport like that that in itself almost is is like a drug sort of well that's like an addiction yeah exactly you become um the best of the best the creme de la creme i equate it with uh, you know navy seals or the rangers you're you're the you're at the top of the sport chain and uh, everybody's looking at you all over the world and thinking wow what a what an honor this is you know and they're worshiping you so to well speak. and not only that for every player that makes it to the NFL, there are how many players that want to come up and take that position. And I, when we spoke to Randy Grimes, former NFL player, he said, you know, you can't sit on the bench nope. and be out with an injury because Not at all. there's a bunch of guys waiting to go in and take your position. Absolutely. And so, yes. yes, Randy and I've talked about this before. And Grant's favorite line was the herd keeps moving. Uh, so you better do whatever you have to do, whether it be take a pill they're offering, take a shot they're offering, um, and all of those things we know now are not good for your brain. <laughs> and it all ends up and affects your brain chemistry and leads to that addiction. Right. What kind of drugs do they typically give him for injuries? Well, after that eighth season, he started coming home with little bags, little pill bags, you know, like the ones that you might get at the drugstore if they were giving you one pill to to last until your doctor got a prescription for you or whatever. So just a little tiny pill bag. 
And I remember thinking they looked like at that time aspirin, right? So I said, what is this? And he said, those are just some pills that help me get through the night. They help me sleep because he was already having a lot of difficulty just getting comfortable, um, ever being able to relax. And they only get one day off a week. And so he just, he would take these pills in this little bag and there would be about two. Um, it was Percocet and Vicodin that I found out later because, you know, back in the 80s we didn't have we didn't have pillfinder.com now i'd be going oh you know looking that serial number up and i'd have that pill identified but we didn't have that because we didn't have the internet so there wasn't any camaraderie there was no way i could do any um, background checking i couldn't take myself up to the um, trainer and say hey tell me what this is you're sending home with my husband but uh, it was Percocet and Vicodin, and he ultimately left the NFL in 10 years with a Percocet and Vicodin addiction. Well, and, you know, you say, well, you couldn't go up to the trainer and ask. Even if you could, why would you? Because there's an exactly. element of trust that yes. the trainer yes. obviously has your husband's best interest yes. at heart, Taking right? Taking care of him. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And that not always the case. Yeah. No. You, so when he went to, when, I'm going to go back up again, he, when he was in high school and when he was in college, did he get injured back then as well? And did, did anything happen with those injuries or was it mainly the NFL where it really started for him? You know, for me, I grew up in Texas, Grant grew up in Southern California. And so we met in Texas in college and he was on a full scholarship. I had no idea what injuries he had previous and we talked about it some and he did say that you know he'd had some concussions he'd had some never had any surgeries because because of football injuries but had still been injured you know his knees hurt um he had some problems with his hands and different things so um i saw even in college that um, you know he'd be on crutches all week long and then he'd play a game well <laughs> i mean Grant what's wrong with this had, picture? <laughs> yeah, what's wrong with this picture? And Grant and I never had this conversation. Um, I didn't ever say to him, hey, in college, did they offer you pills in college? You know, I never really asked him that. But my gut is they did. And um, they weren't looking out for him because now I understand that, you know, sports is driven by money. <laughs> and so, you know, we're going to do whatever we have to do to get them out on the field when they're in college and when they're in professional. I know that still you can have very serious injuries in high school. Uh, we didn't talk about that. I'm sure he'd had some, but I know he'd never had surgery. But, you know, common sense is when you play from eight to 32, that you, if nothing else, you've had a lot of repetitive head hits. Yep. And that the brain had already taken some real serious hits and tolls. Yep. Wow. Okay. So 10 years in and he's done with the NFL and he's addicted to Percocet yes. and Vicodin. What happened then following that? And he, he did, did he realize at that point that he was addicted? I don't think so. Again, by this time, already slowly at the end of his NFL career, he'd been mixing alcohol in with these things too. And uh, then he would dispose of the evidence. It was the weirdest thing ever. It was like he'd drink a 12 pack and then he would take it out to the dumpster, you know. Um, he never wanted to leave anything out. It was a very tidy, you know, he kept everything hidden. Um, I was always looking, but I also had little kids I was watching after too. So I wasn't digging, you know. Um, I didn't start that crazy codependent thing until after he got out of the NFL and I started realizing that he was then hiding the alcohol. So I was putting up clothes one day and reaching into his closet to put some stuff on the shelf and realized there was a huge, gigantic bottle of uh, Crown Royal. And I said, why is this here? Why is it not, you know, in the pantry or we even had a bar at the house. I said, why is it, why is it here? He said, uh, I, I, thought I won it at a golf tournament and it wasn't important for me to keep it out. I just decided to keep it here. That was, you know, the beginning of me going, hmm. And then I had, we had our third baby and I had a C-section and I got a prescription for, I want to say hydrocodone yeah. because I'd had, you know, it wasn't a whole lot of pills, but nonetheless, back in the day, they didn't give you like five pills. They gave you a whole prescription. <laughs> And I just remember he was real excited about going and getting that prescription filled. And I took one, it made me feel so 
sick that I never took any more. I've never been a pill taker, hardly ever taken an Advil, aspirin, anything. And that whole prescription disappeared. So I was in denial. I didn't want to believe, you know, I mean, we don't want to believe when someone we love is an addict. Oh, Cindy, it's... that is that is so <laughs> true. I mean, I can't tell you how many people we've talked to and to confront the fact that yes. your loved one has a problem, it's yes. not easy to do. No, I did everything wrong though. Instead of really confronting him, I, I skirted around it, I lied for him. I became sick myself with the codependency of just cleaning up and tidying up after him and, and not really wanting to look at it for what it was. This went on for years and years and years to the point where when he finally went to rehab the first time we found 15 bottles of absolute vodka hidden around the house you know <laughs> i i gotta tell you cindy i i don't fault you one iota there has been such a stigma on addiction that yes. to there it, it's not dirty okay it's not right. dirty it's not right. It doesn't mean that someone is weak. It doesn't mean that someone has some fatal personality flaw. It's, it, right. it is a situation, in your husband's case especially, brought on by physical injury. Yes. But then there's a, then there's a d drug dependence. And it, yes. I, I, I'm telling you, we hear about it all the time. And I think that the reason why more and more people don't get the help that they need is because their loved ones are not confronting the fact yes. that they have an addiction yes. problem. Yes, it's taken me, Grant's been dead now for nine years, and it's taken me this long for me to, to admit and realize the role that I played in this because I covered up for him. And I'm trying to not be hard on myself. I mean, I cry a little bit about it often. It ruined our whole family, by the way, because my kids saw Grant as an addict, but they saw me as a liar. So that is not a healthy relationship to have a family. We had these three precious kids that I'm just now finally figuring out 10 years later are traumatized. I mean, they are so traumatized for what they saw from their dad and saw from their mother. I mean, I played a huge part in this because society was telling me, you have to look perfect. You can't look like you have an addict. What do you do with an addict? They're bad. They don't ever recover. I mean, those are all the things that we hear and they do recover. And we know that Grants was accelerated because of his horrible brain injury, which was even proven in the autopsy that he had so much frontal lobe damage that he had stage three CTE. You are listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information on the podcast or to reach out, if you have a story you would like to share with us, go to our Facebook page by the same name, or you can email us at theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com, or go to our website, theaddictionpodcast.com, or call us at 727-314- 7080. And please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star review. For more information on our sponsor, Narconon Ojai, visit their website at narcononojai.org. That's N-A-R-C-O-N-O-N-O-J-A-I.org. Or call 1-866-231-5924. That's 1-866-231-5924. Sometimes, the hardest thing about getting someone into recovery is getting them to agree to treatment. Bobby Newman, a certified drug counselor with 30 years experience and an over 85% success rate as an interventionist, has created a series of 12 videos that you can use right now to learn every step to get your loved one to agree to treatment. Call 1-833-918-0008 today and say the word podcast to get a 10% discount. Or go to newmaninterventions.com and type in the word podcast for a 10% discount. 
The service comes with a free one hour consultation with Bobby. So that was a death sentence. So he was trying to juggle through life with a brain injury and an addiction and a wife who didn't know what to do. Yep. Yep. Terrible. Unfortunately, hindsight is 2020. <laughs> yes. Yes. You know? Yes. You mentioned to me, I was listening to your interview that you did before. How did he end up going to a psychiatrist? How did that happen in, in the midst of all of this? I remember you mentioning that. Yes, he went to a psychiatrist because he, he was battling depression. And we didn't really, even then, realize that depression went along with a brain injury. And um, he, had, he was isolating a lot. He felt a lot of confusion and fear and sadness and all of these emotions that I didn't know what to do with. And at the same time, our children were having issues and he couldn't help them because he, he was just trying to juggle with keeping a job. And so um, he went through just going to the general doctor and getting different prescriptions that weren't working. So he finally said, look, I'm gonna go to a psychiatrist. So he goes to the psychiatrist and you know, the answer for all of the, these people are pills. That's right. It's just pill pushing. And so Grant didn't need more pills. I mean, I wish Grant had had a scan of his brain for crying out loud. I mean, there was just, it was a, a huge mess. He would leave the psychiatrist's office and he would leave with pills for anxiety. He took a whole bottle of Xanax in like a week period. It was too much for him. He couldn't he was just looking to feel better. I, I understand that now. He was looking for relief. And um, so the psychiatrist did not, I, I don't feel like the psychiatrist helped him. I, I, I wish that I could have gotten him somewhere where someone would have said, hey, let's talk about your career and the fact that you probably do have a brain injury. Let's try to do some holistic uh, approach by eating better. I mean, I don't know, There's so, there are other things that you can do to try to help yourself that Grant just never had, had or got any help for. Right. And you, and you put your finger on it, um, and not to make this a podcast about bashing the NFL, but the whole purpose there is to win the games. And so the, I am fairly certain that the trainer's whole modality is to get the guy back on the field, it however, is. however he can do that. And you know, I, I was thinking before when you were talking about it, like, why not look at some, like, you know, holistic pain yes. remedies? Yes. Those yes. May, but those may take a little longer. And right. And you've got a guy sitting there and you got to get him right back on the field. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't even realize what a concussion was. It took me years, even after Grant died, for me to really examine the fact that this this was something that damaged his brain. And when he would come in and say he had a concussion, he and I both would just kind of, I mean, mutually we would say it was just a concussion and that, um, you know, at least you're not on crutches. <laughs> I mean, how could we not know as a society, how could we not have ever gotten that message out that when you fall and you hit your head, whether you're on your tricycle, your bicycle, playing soccer, riding a, a motorcycle, dirt bike. How, how come we never got the picture that a concussion meant it was hurting your brain? Because you can't see it. It's an yeah, injury you can't, can't see. see it. They never yeah. do a, an x-ray on it. So you never, you never can see the extent of the damage. And in Grant's case, the only way we ever really equated it was when, you know, they saw the, the autopsy, but, um, just not ever thinking that it was a brain injury that led to the addiction. It was just a misunderstanding from, from me and for Grant. I mean, Grant actually died never knowing. And at the very end of his life, he said, I think I have um, the concussion disease that a lot of people have had in the NFL. And I remember just thinking, what is that? You know, I mean, it, even 10 years ago, we didn't really even talk about those things. Right. Right. And yeah. And the sad thing is that, you know, he felt he had to hide 
you know, the alcohol and his other addictions when what he was really probably trying to do in my guess without, you know, talking to him is handle the pain, the physical pain. Handle the pain. Absolutely. Yeah. I think about that now. And I think again about how I wasn't sympathetic enough. I mean, I I, I kept thinking, you know, every time he'd go to rehab, oh, he's going to get healed. (laughs) And, um, you know, he would come home from rehab and he, it would be just shortly after rehab that he would start drinking again. You know, it was, um, it was impossible for him to get sober under his conditions that, that nobody could put the two and two together for him. And it makes sense for him. He was a very educated person, very logical. I think if we had it to rewind and he, uh, knew the facts that we knew today, I think he would be more quick to quit playing in the NFL, but I don't, I don't think it would have kept him from having the addiction because I mm-hmm. think he, he played enough years regardless, like you said, even just in college that he probably would have been, would have gone down an addictive road. Right. What's the scene with your family now, Cindy? <sighs> Well, it's day by day, and I'm thankful to say that I have a relationship with our youngest one who, um, you know, seemed to be the least affected, and I say that guarded, because he was, um, you know, he never really knew Grant prior to being an addict. Grant was a full-blown addict when the youngest one was born. So, uh, you know, he never knew Grant any other way. The other two did, and I think that that's the hardest thing for them is just they lost so much because it's difficult when even you're young and you see your loved one, your parent go from being one way to being another. So the oldest two are severely affected. All of them are affected, though, by me being the codependent, of course, and them seeing me uh, lie for Grant, clean up for Grant, do all of those things that are not healthy. So I just keep saying it's a day by day thing. I'm not gonna give up. I'm never gonna give up, of course, because I love and adore my children, even though um, the oldest two are not in my life. I'm 31 and now 35. So um, I'm not going to ever give up. And I know that, you know, time heals. And I I, I know that, it's gonna get better. I do think that the, the more and more they look at this, that they will see the truth. Um, I mean, I, I just always pray for them to not um, develop the same habits. You know, sometimes when you have an addictive parent, it becomes something natural for you to do yourself. Yep. And, and I don't know what they, you know, I don't know, I'm not with them. I don't really hear about them. So I don't know, but I know that my boys played sports as well. They both had some really serious concussions during their years. They played all the way through college. So I worry about these things. I worry about them um, coming at addiction, even from the point of just feeling traumatized, because we all know that trauma plays a huge role in addiction. Yep. So that was their dad's go-to. They saw that their whole life. And, um, you know, it's, it's easy for me to say, well, you would think they would never want to be involved in any of this since their dad was, but you and I both know it's not that easy. That's right. And uh, so, I, you know, it's a struggle with me. I'm trying to give them time to heal. And I, of course, always hope and pray that that happens, but you can't force a relationship. Yep. And um, for a long time, I kept thinking, you know, I can just, there's something I can do. You know, that codependency in me kept thinking there's something I can do to fix that. But the best thing I can do to fix that is just to take care of me. And it's taken me all these years to learn that I, the most important thing I can do for my children, even though they're not in my life, is to show them that I can survive and that I can I want to eat right. I want to do all of the things that I need to do to better myself so that they can look at me, even if it's, if it's from afar and see that I've survived and they can too. I think Grant would be thrilled that first of all, I'm continually talking about his journey and I, I have no, I mean, I, there's just, I know that he'd be thrilled that I, I, I can do that. And I don't think he would be surprised because I'm, I've always been outgoing. And um, I, I just, 
I want to continually honor his life by talking about the things that he had a struggle with. And so it was never about exploiting him. It was about talking about the things that now we know could have been different if we'd looked at all of it from a different standpoint. Yep. Tell us about your book that you wrote and thank you for sending well, it to us. Yes, yes. Well, I, the book is After the Cheering Stops and I always say the best place to get it is on Amazon because it comes straight to your door. It's available at Barnes and Noble, um, but it's just, I think Amazon's the best way to get it. And it was just, it's a memoir. It's tragic because Grant dies in the end. And every time I say the story, it never gets any easier. It still ends in death. Yep. Yep. I'm sorry. It's okay. I can't ever get through it without just being sad for what could have been and should have been. And I just say my hat's off to any of these other NFL players who have gotten sober and they live their life the best way they can one day at a time. I'm so thrilled for people that can get there and I want to give everybody the hope that you can. But I also want to tell the people that are family members and spouses that the most important piece of information that I've learned about in all of these years is the fact that I'm only responsible for myself. And all of those years of thinking that somehow Grant was my responsibility, I think even accelerated him at some point to just being, I'm gonna use the word <laughs> insane, just because I felt like we both were. We both were, it, it was just insanity in, in our relationship because I was trying to go control him. He was mad at me for trying to control him. And so it was just this hamster wheel and what might have, it wouldn't have saved his life because he was gonna, he was sick. He was going to die anyway. But I needed, if I had just pulled back and, and not done all that control and right then started trying to take care of myself, um, it could have helped him not maybe to have accelerated as quickly. I don't know. I, I, I don't know the answers to that, but it would have helped me. <laughs> Let's put it that way. It would have helped me and so, um, you know, it's taken me this many years to understand that I had a huge part in this. And I don't think it could have saved Grant's life by, by far, but it could have saved me a lot of heartache from just trying to control something that I could not fix. I get that. I really do get that. I, I get it. You know, I, and I think that people who know someone who's addicted, it's, it's tough because I think parents of children who are addicted, they want to somehow take responsibility for it and yes. they can't because, you know, okay, maybe if you beat your, beat your kid that you could take responsibility for that. But I think more often than not, especially with a lot of what we're seeing today, we're seeing like white collar kids who, you know, are raiding medicine cabinets and, yes. you know, and I think, while the parents sit there and feel guilty about it, they're not confronting the situation and getting their child the help they need. Right. You exactly. Know? And and I think that a lot of times you think, well, I'll just take them to uh, the doctor and they can fix it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, a, an addiction is not just a quick fix. This is an ongoing thing forever. There, there are physical aspects, there are mental aspects, there are spiritual aspects. Yes. They all have to be addressed. And, you know, I don't, we didn't talk much about the rehabs that Grant went to, but I know that with alcohol addiction, just stopping the alcohol can be very, very dangerous. Like, oh, yeah. you know, there's, you, you have to do it properly because of right. the long-term effects of alcohol. Um, right. And Grant got the alcohol and the pills all going. His bathroom cabinet was just lined up with pills. And I know that they were prescription, but <laughs> hey, you can't mix every prescription and then swallow down a bottle of absolute vodka. And I, I mean, seriously, I don't know how he lived without accidentally killing himself for so many years with all the mixture of everything that he was just looking for relief. Yep. Well, Cindy, thank you 
for sharing Grant's story. I'm so sorry that it ended the way it did. It's why Steve and I do this podcast. We want people to listen. We want people to get help so that they don't end up like Grant. It's just, yeah. it's so, it's just sad. It is I, sad. It is sad. And I just appreciate you two for doing what you do because it's so important. People need to know that there's hope. As long as there's life and breath, there's hope. That's right. Cindy, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening and watching today. I think that the one thing I would like you to take away from this particular podcast is that a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times addiction can start because of some physical injury or some physical malady. And while there are obviously times when painkillers are necessary, you have to be very careful. I talked about this once before where sometimes painkillers that are prescribed are complete system painkillers like Oxycontin for a toothache when perhaps ibuprofen or aspirin might be a better way to go to handle a toothache. Um, don't become an addict or don't allow your loved one to become an addict because of some sort of physical injury or malady, get it checked out. Do you know? Um, I think if Grant, in hindsight, if he had known or if they had found that he actual had brain, actually had brain damage, that could have been addressed instead of just masking it with drugs and alcohol. So that's kind of the message I take away from this interview. Thank you for listening. Please, if you know somebody who is addicted, get them into treatment like right away. If you don't know who to talk to about your addiction or someone else's addiction, you can always call our sponsor, Narconon Ojai, at 866-231-5924. There's no commitment. If Narcanon Ojai is not the right treatment for you or your loved one, fair enough. But they can guide you and they can give you references and they can give you resources. The point here is don't wait. You know, it's September 2020. We're still in the middle of the whole COVID crisis. Addiction is not going down due to the COVID quarantines. In fact, if anything, it's going up because people are isolated. So please don't wait get help now for you or your loved one. And we'll talk to you again next week. You have been listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return, sponsored by Narcanon Ojai. For more information on Narcanon Ojai, call 866-231-5924 or visit www.narcanonojai.org. Narcanon is a non-12-step rehabilitation program based on the works of L. Ron Hubbard.